I respect those atheists who say life is trash and I don't know why I should keep living because life is ultimately meaningless. And I respect Nietzsche and Camus and Sartre because they had the guts to face the logical consequences of their atheism. But I have very little intellectual respect for someone who says, there is no God, but he's really valuable. There is no God, but I'm really significant. There is no God, but love is real. No, it's not. If there is no God, love is an animal instinct. And she doesn't love you, and he doesn't love you. You just turn them on. And if you lose your ability to turn them on, they don't love you anymore, let's be honest. And they're on to somebody else. That's all there is, guys. Face reality. Yes, sir. This isn't like a loaded question, but if you didn't believe in a god, you think murder is fine. You don't have any compassion for other people, if not through God. No. False. Because my experience is, I have this ability to love, I know that atheism is wrong. Because atheism does not allow for real compassion. It allows for a biological instinct, but that's all. Why does love have to come from God? Because love is a choice, a free will decision, to work for his well-being. It's an equation of familiarity over time. That's how you like... Baloney. Okay. Love is a free decision to work for his well-being. So then how is it your God? I don't have to decide to love him. I'm not just a chemical reaction. There's a spirit. There's a soul that I have. Why does it have to be tied to God, specifically? Because if there is no God, all of reality is matter and energy. What if there's something else? Okay. Um, all of reality is matter and energy if there is no God. That's all there is, a chemical reaction. Because you guys don't live that way. Well, we live exactly No, you don't live that way. You are longing for a woman to really love you, which means not you can provide for me financially, which is not, hey, you know something, your body turns me on. You long for her to genuinely care for you, and you want to genuinely care for her, I hope. Which shows that there's more to you than just an instinct. You said that we're all primordial, we're all a bunch of ants on a rock through space. If there is no God. If there is no God, then we're all a bunch of ants on a rock through space. That's right. But if there is a God, then that implies that eternity is real, which means we're even more irrelevant. Because no, if eternity is real, everything we do right now is completely meaningless. It's the same way like a cockroach is to the rest of the universe. It's no. A prime, there is it's a, a God, speck of a speck of a speck. It matters in dealing with reality, it in matters reality. in responding to God, in reality, and it matters in responding to people. If, if he was starving, the only reason you'd feed him is because you think there's a God? No, because compassion is real. And the only way justice and compassion can be real is if there is some mind prior to the human mind who creates and defines the values of love and justice. Guys, if there is no mind prior to the human mind, who creates and defines justice and love? No one does. Oh, come on. You know better than that. That's you. Uh, how do you, if we have free will and we're not drawn to one specific definition and it changes constantly, how do we find the right one that's God's will? By searching for God. In order for me to get to know you, I got to listen to you. I can't just go out and make you up. I can't just say, okay, God, strike me with lightning and I'll believe in you. That's about as dumb as me saying to him, hey, buddy, if you really want me to get to know you, you got to do something spectacular. No, if I care about him, I'm going to work at getting to know him. It's no different. It's called developing a relationship, guys. That's what it's called. If you don't learn to develop relationships, you're going to be a very lonely person, very isolated. So let's say that, sure, God is real, and because and because God is real, suddenly everything we do matters. That's just blatantly false. Everything we do is still one decision of a hundred billion people all, who all exist in heaven and hell. And since God is beyond time as well, it's of however many humans that will ever exist. It's completely... It's still completely meaningless, it's just slightly less meaningless. If he is an accidental collection of atoms, if I am an accidental collection of atoms, he is ultimately meaningless, and I am ultimately meaningless. Which means it doesn't matter what I do to him, ultimately, and it doesn't matter what he does to me, ultimately. You choose, and I choose, yeah. and it's yeah. meaningless. Yeah. That is exactly what we're saying. Okay, good. Why does now, change that? if there is a God who created him and gave him innate value, purpose, if there is a God who created a value of compassion and justice, 
then it is ultimately significant how I treat him. And if I am disrespectful to him, if I murder him, that is evil. But if I love him and respect him and promote his life and treat him well, that is ultimately good. Ultimately That's a good in which context? To who? Reality. Reality. That is well, real. By that logic, it's still ultimately insignificant because reality is far too big for your actions to matter. You're not in India right now, sir. You're not in China. You're in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. So now you got to live your life in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. No, so if you're dealing That's with reality, reality for you. Then I have compassion that comes from chemical reactions, not some mythical, my imaginary friend from when I was four years old. I get that. I feel happy. He feels happy. That's all that matters. That's that's where it ends. All right. Why, do, why does God live need to out. be in that equation? Live it out. And if you're going to live it out, it means despair. Okay. And if you don't despair of life, you're intellectually dishonest. How do you propose that... Um, as different people like discuss like different relationships and like have different effects on each other and like how people are perceived differently based upon their Christian values and stuff like that. So like how would you propose talking to someone who is not on the same path as you? Listen to him, understand what he says, respond appropriately, listen to him, understand his philosophical presuppositions that he's making, and then respond appropriately. So if you're an atheist, I'm going to respect that, and I'm going to say, okay, now here's the evidence that God exists. If you're an agnostic, I'm going to say, okay, agnosticism is an intellectual option, but you can't live out agnostic. You know, maybe he's here, maybe he's not. Maybe he's here, maybe he's not. Well, right about now, i got to make a decision. Either he is here or he's not here. Either I stop swinging where his handsome face begins, or I keep swinging. Okay? So agnosticism is an intellectual option. It's a practical impossibility. You can't live an agnostic life because you've got to make ethical decisions every day. Do you cheat? Or are you honest? Do you lie? Do you tell the truth? Do you rape, date rape, or not? You, you can't live an agnostic life. Are you racist or are you not racist? Are you going to defend abused children or are you just going to let people abuse children? You've got to make decisions. You've got to make your life. You have no choice. That's why agnosticism is not an option. But I will listen to the agnostic and try and point that out to them. You can't consistently be agnostic. And then if you're Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim, I'm going to agree with you on certain points, and then I'm going to say, but wait a second, Siddhartha Gautama Buddha, Jesus Christ, is the evidence supporting Buddha or Christ? Muhammad or Christ? The avatars of Hinduism or Christ? So that's the way I seek to listen and understand what people believe. When I'm talking to a white racist, I'm going to say, why are you a racist? And Inevitably, they're going to say, well, it's just because I, the family I was born in, it's my neighborhood, we're racist. And I say, okay, fine. But in light of the fact that God created all human beings in his image, don't you think racism might be wrong? Because we all come from God. He created us. So therefore, to have a racist attitude is evil. It's sinful. But then with my liberal white Christian friend says, oh, no, 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 no. I went to an Ivy League school. And we intellectuals realize that racism is wrong. I'm going to pin him. I'm going to say, okay, fine, why? Are you going to tell me that racism is wrong because the intellectual elite at Harvard or Yale say it's wrong? Give me a break. I could give a rip about what the intellectual elite say. The question is, what's real? And if you're a human being, not an accident, and if you've been created by God for a purpose, then my racist attitude is sinful. And so is yours. So I try to listen to people, understand where they're coming from, and then respond. Does that make sense? Thank you, sir, for raising that issue. What, isn't, is God operating on a different uh, uh, universe and the laws that abide this universe? Is he operating in his own dimension? Well, obviously, yes, he's a spirit. So Which then means what evidence is says, there of that? Pardon? There's, what, what evidence can you draw from looking at how the universe functions and how atoms exist how can you how can you look at something and say this this has always existed there's no start point or end point design order demand an intelligent mind i tried to play basketball at davidson i made the team but i was the worst player on the team i can promise you sir it's very hard to get a ball through a hoop 10 feet off the ground it takes a lot of design a lot of coordination. You guys obviously know that. You got 
the best basketball team in the country right now, right? So, design, order, complexity, demands an intelligent mind. It just doesn't happen by accident. Contradicts how far we've come from an evolutionary basis. No, sir. Evolution as an origin says, behind the process, there's no intelligent mind. And the Bible insists, no. Behind the process, whatever the process is, be it evolution or whatever, there's got to be an intelligent mind. It's that simple. I mean, it doesn't Sir, really require an intelligent where, mind. Where is the creative mechanism in evolution? So adaptation. Exactly. There is no creative mechanism in evolution. So it it's all adaptation, right? So therefore, the philosophical, not the scientific, the philosophical question is, is it more reasonable to believe that behind the process there's an intelligent mind, or is it more reasonable to believe that behind the process there's no intelligent mind, it just comes about by chance? The question is whether or not you believe in adaptation or evolution as a process. You can make a philosophical argument whether or not you believe it's like a creative being or not behind that, but I think that's up to you. But my question that I have yes. is, what are your thoughts on all morality coming from a higher being such as God? Because from my perspective, I do not like that thought process because for me, it absolves you as a human being for making all moral decisions while still allowing you to claim an infinite amount of power. I have power because I'm a human being created in the image of God, and he has given me a limited amount of power. Verbal power, financial power, physical power. But I am not all powerful. I am not God. God is all powerful. I am not. Second point. In order for there to be morality, you've got to have a mind. This here, this grass, this tree, no ability to make a distinction between good and evil, justice and injustice. You've got to have a mind. So the question is, if the human mind is the oldest mind around, then it's the human mind who creates justice and love. But that means it's relative, because this human mind and this human mind and this human mind and this human mind will disagree. According to rational thinking, as I think, it's far more plausible to believe there's an eternal mind, God, who creates the value of justice, creates the value of love. Those are real values. They're not created by human beings. They're not subjective. They're not relative. You can make claim that your God is something that's eternal, that is objective. Right. However, no matter how powerful or objective that being is, you have to make the concession that human beings are not that powerful and that we ourselves are false. So even though the God has sayings on what is acceptable or not, that must be interpreted and passed through a human being. So as soon as it comes through that human being, it is now faulty, just as all our relative reasoning is. I am faulty, but the value of justice is not faulty. I am faulty, but the value of love is not faulty. That value is defined by each of us as individuals. So you might bring your definition from a higher being, but because it is coming from you, you have admitted yourself that you are not God, so you cannot tap into his infinite wisdom or power, therefore you yourself are also faulty. You said our God. We're not talking about the Christian God. We're talking, talking about some type of transcendent source where you get objective morality. So it doesn't come from us. If there is a mind, if there's an immaterial form of justice, we believe there's an immaterial God of some type saying that this is directly right or wrong. That God has to be personal in order to decide what is right or wrong. That God has to be immaterial in order to create time and space. That God needs to be all powerful because it's a pretty powerful act, I would say. And then as a reasonable God, able to reason, he creates as, as reasoning agents so there's no misinterpretation. Oh, and it's hard for me how powerful that God must be to label that God's actions as justice or for them to have the sole definition of what is justice or what is injustice because those are two sides of the same coin. So my question is, how can I label that God as justice when their definition puts me at harm or when their definition comes into conflict with me and my being? Clearly, to me at least, God gave us a conscience, which actually the Bible talks about, that conscience even Immanuel Kant agreed with, that conscience came from a source 
that is cross-cultural in terms of what we are obligated to do, what we should do. There are duties and values for us to follow. That makes way more sense than perhaps our evolutionary upbringing created in us a type of you should do this or should do that in order to really pass on the gene pool. I'll give you one example. One great atheist philosopher said, we descended from apes, so let us love one another. Does that make any sense whatsoever? Zero sense. Well published, let's just say. Shazlav, he's a philosopher. I would read him, I would think about that, and I would pursue also, this gentleman over here said that evolution explains everything. Evolution does not explain why we seek after truth. No animal is seeking after truth. Everything about evolution is survival of the fittest. Protect yourself, protect your tribe. There is nothing philosophically or even in our experience that says, why in the world do we seek after truth? Well, it goes back to that mind. If there's a creative God creating us creatively, cre creatively as human beings, we're gonna seek after truth, not just survival of the fittest in our own gene pool. Well, I do not believe that that truth exists. I think that the search of that truth is what brings us all here together in moments such as these. And why I have a hard time of believing that there is a truth such as on justice, is just because when your truth conflicts with my truth, that tension must now be resolved. So if you believe that your truth is the sole definition and the sole purpose of what its life is, and I also hold that same belief in my own truth, that now justifies us to commit violence against one another because there can only be one truth that is acceptable. So I might claim your actions are abhorrent and you might claim my actions are abhorrent as well. So rather than communicating and resolving that tension and coming to an agreed decision where we can both leave and live in unison, we now commit acts of violence to resolve to decide whose truth is more powerful. And there is absolutely yes. no way, yes. no way that I'm going to say to the KKK, oh, it's all relative, buddy. So if you want to be racist, you go right ahead. No, I am convinced that the value of justice is real because there's a just God who's created it, which means I am going to look the KKK in the face and say, I am sorry, you are wrong. All human beings have equal value, not because I'm a liberal, educated white guy. No, all human beings are valuable because we all are created in the image of God. And God creates us with purpose and meaning. So I'm sorry, my KKK friend, you're wrong in your racism. Yes.